Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure already. Just the drive was a pleasure. Um, I'm a, I'm as um, as Jeff was saying. I'm I'm a Bayou girl at heart. So anytime there are more trees than cars, I'm happy. Um, I want to read uh, a little bit from The Dirty Side of the Storm, which is my second book, and then from The Diener, the most recent one, and a few new poems. And before I tell you a little bit about The Dirty Side of the Storm, I'll just go ahead and read the opening poem. It's titled The Water. In the morning, the water like a deckhand, a persistent curl against the shore, who won't back down, take no, or be denied. It is there under the wharf, and soon under the house, whoring with any swamp rat or snake. It rings cypress knees with pearls. It dreams under the sun like cut cane, throwing back the salt you wash away, then wearing pilings down to air. Your houses wait on stilts tall as pillars, their sheet metal skulls bared to a mildewed sky. Against the fallen trees, rain and lapping tide meet, slapping of nets and fish and naked children pulling driftwood boats in one joyful noise around your sleep. In the afternoon, the water is there, only more, browner and grayer, no sweeping seaweed up your shore, just its presence farther, like a dull brother-in-law in front of TV. He means something to somebody, but not you, not just now. Its slow wake seems harmless, the litany of waves before a storm rolling benignly ashore, intoxicating. And then it is there, all gray length of it, rich sex of it. It wants you so badly, it pounds at the door. Let me take your smallness, your jetties, your broad coast, your loam. It gathers at night beyond the curtain of mosquitoes, darker than the shut down sky, the boarded up clouds. Its desire thrums like an idling outboard. Ignore it and it tows itself into your dreams. It's everywhere, every chance, all the time. It is more certain than death or love. It must have been conceived by death and love. When the last silk sinks under your feet, you will have to walk out on this water. Oh, I think I have to confess that I am trying to learn how to wear contacts. <laughs> this is a failed experiment. So I need some glasses. You, you all look like, like, like vaguely underwater to me. And, and I'm not used to that. So at least maybe the palms will look sharp. And you guys will still look like you're underwater. <laughs> Yeah, but I can see this. Um, all right, let me tell you about let me tell you about the dirty side of the storm. It sounds like it was written about Katrina, but as those of us who live near the Gulf know, we've had a few hurricanes before Katrina, right? So um, I actually finished all of the poems in that book except one before Katrina hit, um, and as um, as Jeff mentioned, my part of Louisiana, which is about 80 miles south of New Orleans, is, is disappearing faster than any land mass on Earth. Most of you know that. It's, um, it's due to um, fertilizer runoff uh, into the river that comes down to Louisiana and kills the marsh grass. It's not so different from what's happening in Galveston uh, because of other reasons, but um, just faster in Louisiana. So the agriculture runoff, um, the oil industry dredging canals uh, through the marsh to reach oil rigs faster, um, and that increases the area of erosion. And then the levying of New Orleans. You save one place, you sacrifice another place. And my 
my home is what, what is being sacrificed. Um, so I wanted to mention for the students who are here who are studying writing, the water came about because I knew I was taking a group of students to Louisiana. Um, I was teaching in Tampa at the time, and one of my filmmaking colleagues said, oh, let's go to Louisiana for spring break with some students, and you can show them you're part of Louisiana, and we can film, uh, um, do some documentary work about coastal erosion. Are you nuts? It's spring break. Why would I want to do that? Um, and fortunately, my friend was persuasive, and we got in a big van, and we went to Louisiana, poetry students and documentary filmmaking students, and it was fabulous. But before we even set off on the road, I decided to try to write a poem imagining what, what our trip was going to be like. So um, that's my throw out there idea for you for a poem is, because uh, it worked for me, is to, um, to write a poem when you know you will be anticipating seeing something or experiencing something, learning something new, but write the poem ahead of time. And so I expected that I was going to revise this poem, but I didn't. Um, and the poem is actually um, about a place called Ile de Jean Charles, which was the inspiration for the movie uh, Beasts of the Southern Wild. Um, and it's actually a Native American community, Homa Indians, Ile de Jean Charles. So that's where I knew we were going to go, and that's what I imagined um, seeing. But I, I very much recommend Beasts of the Southern Wild if you haven't seen it. This poem is titled Fédodo. And a Fédodo is uh, the Cajun name of a dance. Um, and it literally means make sleep, go to sleep, because families brought their children to the dance because you could stay longer and you don't have to pay, pay a babysitter, you know. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You bring your kids, you don't have to worry about them. So you just put them to sleep on the side of the dance floor and you can stay longer. Fado do. A green heron pulls the sky behind it like a zipper. Sharp rows of clouds fold into themselves, erasing the framed blue tide. Barrier islands disappear into the gulf's gray mouth. Everywhere, something strives to overtake something else. Grass over a mound of fill dirt, ants over grass, the rough shading of rust between rows of sheet metal frustrating the sky. Boats breast up three deep in every slip and as soon docked or waved away. The only music's crickets and lapping Happy bullfrogs on slick logs, a rustling skirt of palmettos around the roots of a modest oak that appear after hard rain. A fiddle or idling motor moves away. Go to sleep. God will come in an extended cab for all of us. The children, the dogs, the poets. That old adversary, the gulf, our suckering mother, having given everything, will carry the whole of us away. <laughs> Psalm at High Tide. Rain on the river's vinyl surface, water that glitters, water that hardly moves. Its branches witness to trees, to fronds, leaves, crab floats, pilings, shopping carts, appliances. The divine earth takes everything in its wounded side and gives back wholeness. It bears the huddled profane and endures the soaking venerated in its wild swirls. This river fixed with wooden weirs, radiant in misshapen glory. Back in 2007, um, I started um, training to be a hospital chaplain. And it was something that I got a little interested in when I was in divinity school, but it wasn't part of my program of study. A lot of the, the, my peers were going to be ordained. And uh, in most uh, Protestant denominations, it's a requirement toward, toward ordination that you do some clinical pastoral education. But that wasn't my path, so um, I didn't do it. But in 
Um, in 2007, I came back to that interest. And one of the first words that I learned was diener, D-I-E-N-E-R. Never heard that word. Wasn't in any dictionaries. But in the hospital, um, it's what the person who runs the morgue is called. Not necessarily the pathologist, but the person who runs the morgue. And it comes from the German for servant. Um, so the diener at the hospital I was working in, Tampa General, I was in Tampa at the time, marvelous guy. His, his, his name is Raphael. And Raphael's also um, uh, in, um, in some versions of the Bible, in, um, in the book of Tobit, the, one of the archangels, and he's the angel of healing. So sort of funny that that uh, we got Raphael the Diener, and I, th I thought of him, I thought of him as, as the servant of the dead. Um, he was just incredibly compassionate, um, compassionate man. So the title poem is The Diener. We hated the early anatomists for showing us how fragile we are, how God's image is composite, the liver, the bright bruise of a sunset, the thyroid wrapped around our throats for luck. They saw our brains folded against our foreheads and knew our hearts pumped dumbly on through the wash. And wily guts take the brunt of it, pushing to get rid of while we insist on taking in and taking in and taking in. Theirs was heresy, that is, a choice to reach the artist by testing the art, human suffering always the requisite cost. Change what keeps all of it the same, the teacher says, no new thing under the sun. What we make, let's make old instead, older than the first tool, which smelled much like the body, the first blacksmith must have thought, not quite like displaced blood, but blood at home in its place among other parts in their places. And that must be how we began to confuse the power to examine and change with the power to create, to be discrete agents. Why we like to see ourselves as whole, despite the diener piling legs on a cot, despite the pruned artery tied and cut. Did you know that leeches were making a comeback? Did anybody know that? You did know that. I did not know that. <laughs> and I walked into a room in the burn unit, and I could see this thing hanging from this guy's hand. I thought it was a piece of gauze. <laughs> no, it was a leech. Um, so this poem's titled Herudo Medicinalis, and that's the, that's the um, Latin name for the medicinal leech. Perudo medicinalis. It is hard to be misunderstood. And how many of us get vindication after a century or so? I mistook the little bloodsucker for a wad of gauze as it whirled from the sailor's spliced thumb. It became an iridescent helix, a liquid amber's leaf dangling through a day-long spring and fall and spring. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? Forgotten all your Latin but opiate and parasite? Believe it's God who eats at our table? The sailor calls his savior Fat Albert. Come on, there you go, he soothes. Fix me all over, fix my heart, fix everything around me. What carries us forward when I enter the room is the blankness, the sheets, the walls, the page. Language itself is prophylactic. It avails us, suspends the hours for us, inscribes our intention, seems the ordinary, provides for the whiting, in which, in this case, the sailor and I can make our poem. His poem is about wholeness and joy. Mine is about the illusion of linear progress, about Albert spinning his symbiotic segments as he waits in his salty picks, both host and communicant the three of us chanting the same poem. Oh. 
ha. And this poem is titled Pearl Snap. And I'm here, so we all know what that is. I always have to explain what a pearl snap is. This is a joy. Okay, pearl snap. Education is the answer to our social woes. And not the get a good job after high school, but the deep plotting kind, the making of many books kind, get everybody together to debate the big questions kind. When I'm in Walmart and some kid dangling by the wrist is screaming, his mom in shorts that slice her thighs, saying something deep to him through her teeth, her long hair smelling like she has more than one job, I know it's not her fault. She's carrying a combination wallet cigarette case with a pocket for the lighter. Her husband, while the father of her last two, her divorce isn't final from her ex, is waiting in the truck, a Ford. Her dad had a problem with that until they went duck hunting and worked it all out. Her man didn't graduate, even though his junior high let the boys go when trawling season began, but going back got harder. She took typing and bookkeeping and even AP math. She says she manages a convenience store where you learn how to just take on the present. Right now, she just needs to find that pearl snap for her oldest. And why is it suddenly so dang hard to find a boy's 12 pearl snap? There are a few like her in every cow town. When the copter brings a woman's child, a certain woman of that kind, from the parish or the county to the city, and we all stand around the trauma bay watching environmental services sweep up the gauze wrap and cut clothes, and that woman from the boonies is still not here, driving her husband's truck as hard and steady as she can. I'll meet her in family consult or stand her in the shiny hallway. She'll go anywhere. And depending on what the test tube intern has to say, she'll either squat, lay her forearm against her stomach, and loose that first whale groan that defies conceit. Or she'll tutor me in the language of living in good faith, of staring down what I have to say and opening her mind to it, taking it in like a nursling and knowing it whole until the two can sleep side by side. We tell her, it's going to be a long road. And she says, as long as there's a road, I'm on it. Ten Fathom Ledge. All that's visible is a ribbon of coral, briny phrasals above a ledge nearly erased by silt and scalloped water, ghostly and opaque. Beyond is the dead outer shelf, its tragic red surge of blossoms bruising the abyss. What to do? The others have entered the freighter's wrenched hull, their light beams sliding like opera golves along the awkward deck and sides. I am left playing with goatfish on Ten Fathom Ledge, the forbidden step off your grandmother's porch, the first plank as far as you will go toward the long bright yard, the pitch of children rippling from a swing. Why not be content with spade fish and nurse sharks? the confusion of gravity, the wise bezel that grasps all our time as bottom time. A gentle surge toward the wreck lifts, pauses, then sloshes me right back on the ledge. Everything lasts forever. The jetties, sand, sky, pipers, even the pebbles of sea glass, cobalt, old as lace doilies. Others can walk down the beach toward thin shacks and driftwood shelters, toward haze and mist. I'll sit on an unclaimed log, which has drifted here, for now, and watch a midday sun crystal on the waves. Don't be fooled. The gulf is not a polished cruiser or a V-hull on the dock. The gulf is not a flat iron idling between sets of bowing waves. Its striated water lifts itself inch by inch and closes in on the shore. It is alive, playing its chords, humming its undertow. 
You will be welcomed on your back as it slides its dress collar over your thighs, runs its breezes and tensions all over you. It will welcome your face floating down, closed eyes are open as it breathes August strong sweat. It will welcome you a thousand times. It wants you to practice sinking and feel how much you belong. Others can walk the shore's silver brocade and pace back again. Don't be fooled. The sky is complicit. There's no discerning compass here. The wings and water pull equally toward the beauty of transparency. Sirai, sea fans, music, love, and the pans and stirrups of pelicans, which weigh that anything is possible, but that nothing has to be. I have a, I have a couple, well, more than a couple really brilliant colleagues, okay, but two in particular. Um, and Every now and then, I just get tired of Greek myth. Anybody else feel that way? It's like, I'm just tired of Greek myth. I don't want to hear about Zeus. You know, I don't want to read another poem about Persephone. You know. And then I say that, and somebody writes a brilliant poem about Persephone that I love. But, <laughs> but I'm just giving you the background of what mood I was in when I decided to write this poem. And I was in the mood that I was tired of Greek myth. <laughs> and my two brilliant colleagues talking about myth. So I wrote The Best of Us. Give me your Greek myths, and I'll give you the Carmen Keefe Bridge. Forgotten, whatever it was called before, where 30 years ago Trey scaled the steel lift, still hot from the sun of the day, with a spray can under his chin to inscribe the I-beam with the promise of her memory and the imprimata of his passion. <laughs> or when Oris G. did his girlfriend on the front lawn at lunch, I was speechless with admiration. The football coach looked him right in the eye, and Oris looked right back. The coach hardly able to draw his smile or keep from pounding Oris on the back as if he were a safety just trotting off the field with his first interception. What girl could I hold, even under the bleachers? Trey sat with his brother on the T-top of their Trans Am, a big wing-stretched bird stamped in gold on the hood. They drank the better of a 12-pack under the scrawl of a new constellation. There was no moon. There was no call. Mr. Keefe went to early mass with his wife and four daughters, Auburn muses sliding into his car, one hotter than the next, down to his baby girl, whose breasts even the straight girls attended. Did Carmen see the blazon first, or did her father? Driving with his neck stretched as if the crimson letters themselves were suitors tearing up his sod and eating at his table. Before the sun set, sandblasters were at work clouding the message and blotting the sword. Fathers themselves, they scrubbed the rust patches and rivets almost to clouds, like those around great mountain peaks, red rocks and crags reaching through two visible haze. Trey, watered down to foam by the gritty spray. Loves, columned in faint streaks, but Carmen, flaring like the night it was born from Trey's nozzle. All that Mr. Keefe could not rid himself of. How his baby became the protagonist. How she acted through the actor, freeing herself through photon bonding at the head of this, our Bayou infrastructure. Shame is such a bastard. It's fly-by-night parents, cowardice and hubris, all that we know better than God, all we hide from the grass and the sky. Her name will be remembered, not like a trophy or the blotted girl on the lawn, but like a woman who guards the pass or a woman who starts a war. And my bridge just got painted over, like last year. <laughs> it, was, it was there for, oh, what is that, 35 years? What was the point of that? What was the point of that after 35 years? It was, a, I mean, it was a, an icon, at least for me. 
probably not for the Greeks. I'll read, um, I'll read two more poems, and um, they're new. The first one is titled, My Lot. Across the street most mornings, the field's far patch looks shorn. The light has a brilliant edge that evens across the grass. But it's not cut, really. This morning, though, the whole of it is brown with billets. And I remember, I lost you. I took the blade of my crazy and cut us down. Now the birds come for the confused insects. They eat the field. They fly away. And some of the, um, some of the really old tombstones in um, Cajun, Louisiana, have the French for born and died, and it's Ne Decide. So that's the title of this poem, Ne Decide. And I guess it's, um, well, in part, I guess it's dedicated to those of us who have to go home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> or maybe who can't go home for Thanksgiving and find ourselves in an alter alternative Thanksgiving. Ne decide. We were seated around the Thanksgiving table, turkey, stuffing, potatoes au gratin, eight or ten of us, when I noticed, as I passed on the green beans and slivered almonds, that they were all dead. Gelatin-eyed, orifice oozing, putrefying, dead. I hadn't detected the strong smell above the broccoli casserole and crusty brown and serves rolls. I had been passing the wine, passing the water, talking to myself about my affairs. As their fingers lifted slightly from the table, I laid coins on their eyes and kissed their brows. I freed the dogs, who seemed warm, from their filthy pens. One shouldn't look for the living among the dead or be fooled that the dead are no longer living. Back at the farm, my father, dishes done, moves a stick through rye grass and a sharp-tailed snake heads for a thicket. He wanders below Douglas firs and smokes a cool cigarette. In the mornings, I lie with him in the orchard and watch the elk calves leap like static. Sometimes a young bull, mostly cows clowning, distracting us while their cow friends unlace liberty apples from the lowest branches. He hasn't aged. His nose is still broken, and his knuckles are a size too large. For July, his skin is burned patriot red, and his eyes are green, green, green. The hyphen between his dates is so tiny, carved into the mausoleum's marble. It is a freckle, half an ellipsis. It's meant to pull the years one on top the other. It's meant to erase itself like an iris wipe before the end. On the farm, I cut the grass with a push mower. I try to save the wren's nest I dislodged with the cane knife, his, that I had been swinging through the brambles. I nail new shingles on the porch steps when it rains. Every morning I bring you tea in bed is his tomorrow. The tray empty, the kettle and steam quiet, the bricks fire polished and weightless as they fall. Thank you.